Hey coaches, welcome back to the podcast. In today's interview, we have Coach Leo and Coach Jack Carrillo. Jack is a private goalie trainer. He has a keeper-specific business in New York. He's had a business for about five years. I think my favorite part of this interview, um, I just got done watching it, it is the part where he talks about going from doing things with cash, switching over to a much more organized model, Um, and how that helped him grow his business. But Jack shares so much information in this podcast. Um, He talks about how he got started, the challenges that he had, um, like his goals that he has about running residential camps, which is a a really cool thing to hear about. And uh, I think you're going to gain a lot of valuable information from today's interview uh, with his journey that he's had so far with his business. So sit back, enjoy this interview. And uh, if you want to chat with me after you watch this, shoot me a text. My number's right below this video. You'll be able to see that in the description. All right, and I'll chat with you soon. So I was about 15, 16 when I started coaching. My father was actually his coach at the time. And uh, I, where I was growing up, soccer was starting to get popular, but it wasn't something that was still, like I'm, I'm based in Orange County, New York mainly. Um, I currently don't reside there, but I, I still mainly do most of my work there. And while I'm doing my, my, my training when, as a kid, there wasn't really the soccer coach. There was no, no one that had the specialty. It was mostly still dads and things like that. And what ended up happening was my dad, being the intellect that he is, uh, learned to study the game, read all the books that were out there, became a huge fan of, obviously, Sir Alex Ferguson, became a big Manchester United fan in the process. And I learned a great deal of my coaching, especially with larger groups from my dad, because he was so well, so good at uh, breaking down skills so that someone who doesn't understand it would know. Then because specialties weren't really there, I gravitated towards goalkeeping. I loved the position. I liked the pressure. I liked what it was kind of about. And I thought it was kind of a fun thing to throw myself on the ground. So uh, my parents sought out goalkeeper coaches and there wasn't any in New York. Uh, So I started going to a soccer camp once a year. My parents weren't very, uh, weren't as fortunate to be able to provide more than that. And the camp that I, my parents found was a company called Star Goalkeeper Academy. And Star Goalkeeper Academy is owned by and founded by Dan Gaspar. If you don't know who Dan Gaspar is, he used to be the, uh, Benfica goalkeeper coach. He was the Portugal national team goalkeeper coach. And uh, he just recently finished with Iran, actually. I think he's been to the World Cup two or three times already as, a, as one of the staff coaches. And what I learned through his staff was the excitement, having fun as a goalkeeper, knowing that mistakes do happen, learning how to let it go. And it built me to be a better goalkeeper. But it became one of those things where I only got goalkeeper training once a week. I mean, one week every every year because that's all it was. The camp was very expensive. It was about $700 at a time. I think it's now closer to 1000 depending on what he's doing. But he, he his program used to run all over the country, and now it's mainly based in Connecticut. So from there, as a student through it, I started – finding myself helping out younger goalkeepers, teaching what I was taught. And I built my, my system uh, once I graduated college around 22, 21. Uh, I started working at a facility where I was the goalkeeper coach. And the facility was based in Orange County. So I was getting to kind of go back and do what I like to do, which was help out the kids that didn't have it because I didn't have it. And I was molding a little bit of my information and my knowledge from one coach and a couple of my other coaches, uh, like my goalkeeper coach in college as well. And I kind of developed my own system while I was teaching at a younger age, between 20 and 25. Mm -hmm. At about 25, I started noticing that the numbers were really high, but I was working for someone else and they were accumulating more of the profits. And when I asked if we could 
negotiate and change how we would do the payments for me because my program is being so 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 successful he had a negative reaction and it led to me leaving the facility thankfully the majority of the people did follow me to the next facility that facility i was actually managing while also doing the goalkeeping programs mm -hmm. but it was short-lived i actually tore my acl uh, while playing, I was playing semi-pro for a while. I tore my ACL, and during that time period, no one was able to properly step into my shoes, so the facility actually didn't work out after I wasn't there. So the owners sold the facility to another company, and they went a different route than sports. So from there, I, I took a little bit of a hiatus from coaching uh, the class environment, and did more of a uh, individual one-on-one -on -one private training. At that point, I was definitely doing a lot of cash-based stuff. And it, while it helped with the revenue, I wasn't really able to track anything. I wasn't able to really say like, oh, I made this much of a profit or not. And I wasn't factoring in my travel or anything like that. So as a younger coach, I was making, in my opinion, a lot of mistakes that now as an adult, I know more, more well about. But uh, then what ended up happening was I, I coached a few colleges instead. I was working for Nyack College for a few years. I worked for St. Thomas Aquinas for a few years. And during that time period, I uh, met my wife. We got married. Uh, and to actually help pay for the wedding, she told me I should get back into it because it's what I love. And it would be better than me picking up like a night shift job. Yeah. So I, I very thankfully said, yes, I'll get back into it. And I started forming uh, the plan for summer camps, uh, clinics, private sessions, and working with travel teams as a, or clubs, as opposed to trying to find a home base that had classes. And that has grown over the last five years into something that we're pretty proud of. We work with about a hundred goalkeepers a year uh, maybe a little bit more consistently. And I have eight coaches that now work under me through that are either still in college or they are graduating and they have their part-time job or their other job. And this is their secondary thing. And we do winter clinics, spring clinics, summer camps. Um, we, we are now looking into doing a holiday goalkeeper war tournament that will be in the fall. But obviously a lot of stuff has to go in the right path to do that. So what we have planned for this summer, we have three summer camps planned starting in July. Mm -hmm. The spring break, I actually have one of my coaches. He's gonna be running his own goalkeeper uh, spring clinic. So, and I'm currently working with three goalkeeper, three soccer clubs right now as their goalkeeper coach. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. So, so tell, us, tell us a bit more in detail about your business then how how are your how's your company different to another goalkeeping uh, company so this has become the the conversation that i've had a few times with more or less just other like-minded people and that is orange county new york is not known for its financial stability i want to say there are a lot of people that do have, that are very financially stable, very, they have their families, but it's a different cost of living than living closer to New York City. It's a, about an hour, hour and a half north of the city. So property is a little bit less, uh, jobs pay for a little bit less and things like that. So the idea that a former pro soccer player is gonna come into Orange County and charge $150 an hour, it's, it's very short lived. So I've seen a lot of goalkeeper coaches come in and they don't stick around. They move either to Westchester where people have a little bit more money or they find an academy program or a uh, premier program in another state and they move on. And that's one of the big things is where I have focused the majority of my, my business as not making the prices unattainable Mm -hmm. offering discounts, especially when parents have multiple kids that are interested um, and keeping the, the concept more about the numbers as opposed to about the, the, the price tag. Uh, I'm not someone that's going to walk around with an ego saying that my goalkeeper coaching style is the best, 
I actually tell people, if you are interested in looking at so-and-so and so-and-so, I usually tell them you should go and not have his own, own home base. Uh, she does. But those are the two others that have a very similar concept. We are trying to prepare them for what we're seeing goals being scored on. We're trying to teach them about not just the proper technique and safety, but also how to develop and grow for the higher levels. But where my company differs more from the other two is I really heavily specialize in goalkeepers that have never played before. That developing younger goalkeeper. Yeah. So my uh, one of my goalkeepers who's currently at uh, West, Virginia, uh, West Virginia University, when I started working with him, he was a striker that just wanted to learn goalkeeping at nine years old. Now he ended up falling in love with it. And now he's one of the goalkeepers. He's playing, he's, he's having a great time. He's loving it. Uh, he's one of the backups. They have about four keepers. They're very, very talented group. But uh, yeah, I don't specialize in only the goalkeepers that can do the full extension diving save. I'm working with the goalkeepers that can't catch yet. And I want to make sure that they have that ground, that level, that skill before we move on to the next stage. So I think that's probably where I defer the most because I really take a teacher approach and have a curriculum-based system. Okay, cool. Like, like that. So you, you've been in, in coaching for, for a long time and working especially with keepers. What would you say is the one or two things that a good goalkeeping session must, must have? A good goalkeeping session must have fun, 100%. If it is just a session of drills and a coach is hammering them with like, get up, get up, get up, get up, but they don't have that fun with it, it becomes a chore. So energy, fun from the coach has to happen. Um, enjoyment from the keepers has to happen. And I always say this to every single person. Uh, I don't know if you can hear the kids in my school are getting ready for their lunch. Um, <laughs> the, I always ask three questions after every single session, especially with my clinics, because clinics are much more rushed than my camps, which is a full day. And I asked them three questions. I said, did you get a good workout? And they, almost everyone's like, yes, because I, we, we put them through a lot of footwork based activities before we get them into the hard training. Then I asked, I said, did you either learn something new today or did you get better at something you already had? And 90% of the time I get, I get, I got better. Yeah. Or I get the new student that's like, I've never heard that before. I've heard it differently or something. And then the last question I asked is, did you have fun? And that is my goal. I have to have that for me. And that's why, because at the end of the day, we are choosing a position that's high pressure that usually gets blamed for the loss <laughs> yeah. that at the end of the day is standing in front of a ball that's being kicked as hard as possible that may hurt us. And we're choosing to do that because we like it. The mm -hmm. second you don't enjoy doing that anymore, you shouldn't be doing that. So I always stress making sure that the kids have fun. Another thing that I think every single class, uh, every single class, I say class because I'm a teacher, every single a uh, program or training session that we do should have a plan. What is the goal of today? If you are just going to go out there and wing it, you're going to actually lose the goalkeeper that doesn't want just fun. Mm -hmm. So having fun is important. Even for the, the, the pro keeper or the semi-pro keeper, the college keeper, they need to have fun because they want to enjoy it too. But mm -hmm. you're going to lose that mentality person if you don't have a structured plan and they'll stick around for a couple, but they're going to lose you in the long run. They're going to go somewhere else. That's going to give them what they're looking for. And then the last thing is you have to meet them at where they're at and then show them what the challenge of the next level is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For instance, I, I coach a, a club where we have, they give me all their keepers at once. Mm -hmm. And I have premier level goalkeepers with a, with goalkeepers that can't catch. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to present a plan that's gonna push that pro, that, that premier level goalkeeper with a girl that is just starting as a goalkeeper because mm -hmm. she is younger and she wants to experiment. How yeah. do I do that? I have to have a plan that's gonna be able to hit both of their skill sets 
but also show that I can challenge the, the little one that's learning, but also make the premier goalkeeper not feel like she's wasting her time. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's where I feel are the, probably the most important aspects of the goalkeeper training session. If you have that, you're really putting together a really good program. Awesome. Love that. Love that. So now that, now that you touched upon it, something I know our coaches, especially in our program, they sometimes struggle with is when they have clients that are at different levels. So how do you, you know, how do you deal with that situation where you've got one goalkeeper that's, that has that mentality, wants to get ahead, and then you've got the other goalkeeper that might just be there for fun or it might just be sort of a development do you put them together or are they separate? How does that work in your business? For my programs, they're not together. For my, when it's my program, I'm putting you in a program that's going to work with like-minded skill sets for the goal of growing. It doesn't help a, when you're, because the truth is, is that a lot of people don't understand that when you're doing a program where you're developing an individual, you're still working with the group. So, and the group is building off of each other. They're feeding off of each other. So if you think that, well, the little one is, or the younger one, or or maybe just the less experienced one, is having a situation where they're by themselves, even though they're together, so I can just do a different thing with them. The older one knows it. The older older one sees it. The more skilled, the more experienced one, they see it, And they're not as prepared for their next shot. That's not fair to that person. So what I do with my camps, we'll we'll, we'll base it off that, is we break it off right off the get-go with two age groups. We have a summer goalkeeping, future pro. I've flirted with a couple of different names. A younger group. And that group is 14 and younger. Then I have an older group. Because at the end of the day, camps are more geared towards a little bit more committed goalkeepers. So 14 and under, and then I have the 15 and up. And I call that my Elite Development Academy. And the big difference between the two is that the Elite Development Academy, at 15 and up, they work together. They're one group. The younger group, I split the 14 and 13 and the advanced 12-year-olds from the, from the less skilled. And the reason why I do that is because we're going to have nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds that are, that are there to either train or maybe because the parents just want them to do stuff. And they say, like, you know what? There's a goalkeeper camp. My kid likes soccer. He's nine, 10 years old. He should try it. And I'm like, that's fine. We'll make him a goalkeeper. I, I'm happy with that. But that nine, 10, 11-year-old isn't going to be able to work heavily with the 12-year-old that's been playing travel soccer for three years already. So, and also the, the ball size is different. So the U12, U13, U14, they're playing with the full size official five, size five soccer ball, where the third, where the 11 year old and younger is playing with a size five, but size, sorry, size four. So because they're using a different ball and they are of different size, different strength, things like that, I want to break them apart. And then what we do on the very first day is we evaluate every single one of them. And if there's a 15-year-old that's in that older group that isn't ready, we tell the parents, hey, listen, we strongly recommend that he goes to, a, to the lower level. We have no problem reimbursing you the difference. Or if you want to use that for a future, future clinic, future program, future camp, you're welcome to. Mm-hmm. If there's a 14-year-old that is just out of this world or – just has maybe a, a little bit stronger physical development, we bring them up. And then we tell the parents, hey, listen, we think that this, this is really going to put a better opportunity and better experience for your, for your son and your daughter. So we do have to separate it. Now, the problem with a club training program, so for instance, if you were to train a team, even if this is not soccer, train a team, there's going to be skill levels all over the place. Yeah. The is knowing sometimes you want to have a balanced group but sometimes you want to put those stronger kids together even if it's a small drill so one thing that we really focus heavily on with my program is footwork i believe that a goalkeeper in the right place at the right time is going to have a much better chance to make a save than a, than a goalkeeper that's unbelievably athletic in the wrong position 
-hmm. So we stress, stress, stress footwork. If I were to put a skilled goalkeeper with someone who doesn't have the skill and put them through a footwork activity that was high energy and high rep repetition, you're going to see the more skilled goalkeeper, the more advanced goalkeeper feel like he's taking a step back, not taking a step forward. So it's about learning about how to balance it together. Now, mm -hmm. the other thing that's very important that I like to do is I like to play games with my goalkeepers. At that time, bring them back. Bring the, the less skilled and the more skilled together because you do want the younger, less skilled, or less experienced player to see what that next level is. Yep. And if you don't get exposed to it, you're never going to know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's how I approach it with my business. I guess if I was to summarize it, it, it clubs, it's difficult. Like, a, like a working with a team, it's difficult because you are working with everyone together. Mm -hmm. What I do is I separate the two. Uh, I try to create two, two to three groups. I try to give them two areas. But at the end of the day, we are all working together. With my camps, with my clinics, we separate the age and then we subdivide the ages within. And we make sure that there's at least one to two coaches working with those specific groups while I am more bouncing around and maybe putting forth more effort with either the kid that's never caught a ball before or I see that, hey, you know what, that coach with that elite group, we need to, I, need to, I need to raise my coach's attitude. So I'm going to step in and make that coach see what that, hey, no, we're going to go harder. They can handle yeah. it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's how I, so I do believe that there's, there's quality for them to come together, but that's more the time for the games, more the time for the inter-competition, mm -hmm. not at the point of the training. When, you're, when we're here to train, we are here to work. We do want to make it fun. We'll throw out the jokes, but we got to make sure that we are focused when we're doing it with the right caliber of player. So love that. Great, great response. Perfect. So, uh, so let, let me take you back, Jack, to where, when you first started your business, Yep. what so, was, what has been the, your, your biggest obstacle since you started co your, your coaching business? I didn't, I didn't understand how to, as a business owner, pre-business mm -hmm. owner, I should say, mm -hmm. know how to negotiate what I should get paid for mm -hmm. my service. Mm -hmm. I kind of, said, I want a coach, so I'll take whatever. Yeah. And that that did cripple me when I decided I wanted to renegotiate that. I think I mentioned with the facility. That was, yeah. that was the truth was, is I think the owner knew renegotiating meant him losing profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as a business owner, I, I see that. As, as someone who now owns my own business, I do see that. Uh, but at the same time, though, there's a way to properly communicate to staff that wants to grow. But my biggest issue as a, as a pre-business owner was I didn't know what my worth was. Mm -hmm. So I accepted what someone told me my worth was. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's interesting you say that because I, I sometimes think to myself, right, goalkeepers are more specialist position. So... Maybe there's more opportunity in that. You know what it is? It's we are the afterthought, even still today. Like people mm -hmm. are, I think the thing is that the, the idea is changing, mm -hmm. um, mostly because parents are actually getting more educated, which is a positive and a negative. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a conversation for another day. Yeah. But um, no, like the truth is, like what I was first saying was like, well, I specialize myself. But I didn't have the say. And the reason why I said that first part before I talked about the pre-business side of things was that, yeah, there is always the goalkeepers, one to two goalkeepers on almost every single team. So there should be a high number, especially since I was one of the only goalkeeper coaches in the area. The problem is, is that a club is going to say, well, I'm already paying 10 coaches to coach my 10 teams why am I now going to pay for a goalkeeper coach to coach my 10 teams goalkeepers? Mm -hmm. And so when I was starting out, goalkeeper coaches was not, not a, not an important factor, especially with travel programs and the, like right after town teams, like right yeah. after the wreck, these kids are now playing games and we're just throwing kids in goal that either don't know how to run as well or can kick the ball further than the other kids or is a gymnast and they 
they want to also play soccer. So they're kind of acrobatic. And so that's what I was kind of saying where you being a specialist in goalkeeping at a time when goalkeeping wasn't a priority, mm -hmm. I kind of just forced to do whatever the, the field player coach was doing. Yeah. yeah. I, wasn't able, I wasn't able to communicate with them on that. And mm -hmm. then on the business side of things, not knowing what my worth was because you deal with the coaches that tell you, Hey, this is goalkeeping is not as important. I just took whatever I, whatever I was given. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's where it kind of falls. And that, that looking back at it, I think a lot of coaches, a lot of goalkeeper coaches probably had that problem. Mm -hmm. um, I would say everybody, because a lot of the better, a lot of the goalkeeper coaches that are more established than me, like for instance, someone like John, he had a great relationship with uh, field player coaches and program directors that valued it. Mm -hmm. So when you value goalkeeping, you can build that specialization clientele quickly. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that's how John did it. I don't know John's story, but I just know that John does, has a great program that he does in New Jersey where he, and I know he has great relationships with St. Benedict's, with Red Bulls, because he's built that relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, this was our few conversations, but like for me, I mean, I came out of Hudson Valley, New York. I played SUNY Cortland. I, they, and they just started semi-pro when I was like in my late twenties. So I was, mm -hmm. it was a bit too late for <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Love it. So, so Jack, where, where do you see private training going in the U S in the next two to five years then? Well, that's the one thing I will tell you. We are, our biggest problem in the country uh, is well, private privatized training or supplemental training. It's it's the direction of every sport. It's it's uh, like obviously they they're trying to find the best AAU basketball coach to get their kid to the best college to get their team or the best high school program to the best college to hopefully go in the NBA. Um, you're going. If you play peewee football, you're paying for your trainer to get your running back to work with a training facility to develop so you can get scholarships. It, it, it is definitely the direction that things have been going. I think that it's going to continue that way. Um, I do see a higher push, especially in the soccer world, for the premier program. And it's a pay-to-play model in the U.S. So yeah. being that it's a pay-to-play model in the U.S., that is both a positive and a negative. So on the positive side, yes, if you if you are developing, you have that opportunity to play at a higher level mm -hmm. and you're usually paying money to get there. But mm -hmm. not paying money to get on the team, but paying money to develop and grow with coaches. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the, the more you're able to commit, the more you're able to go. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem I have is always making sure that the parents and the players know the last thing that any one I work with has is burnout. I don't want a single kid to be like, I'm going to college. I don't want to play anymore. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a commitment to work with private training. So we want to make sure that they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That it, it's, it, that's the, that's the only, that's the only focus that I think private training needs to happen make sure you're enjoying what you're doing not doing it and hating it while you do it because mm -hmm. i want the kid to succeed even if he chooses not or she chooses not to play soccer in the future they're going to still value what you were able to work with them on mm -hmm. as an uh, as a young adult and that that's the goal i mean and, and an end game for me is that they value what we what we provided them mm -hmm. so i think that private training it's it's always going to be there it's always going to be the direction i think that it's always going to be positive and yeah. i think that more and more trainers are becoming more educated mm -hmm. for instance i know more about physical development than mm -hmm. i ever did so when a goalkeeper asks me hey what are some good workout programs for goalkeeping that i can do in the gym I can give them some advice, but I always refer to them to, to work with a, a, a trainer in that field. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm even more knowledge than I was. I have more information now because I took the time to learn it. Mm -hmm. And I think more 
as they're doing that. So they're not just focusing on, all right, well, this is how you catch the ball and I'm going to just focus on that. No, they're like, you know, I, no, I see what's happening and I want to work and also recommend this other personal mm-hmm. trainer and that. So it it's, 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 it's an interesting, I don't know. I want to say it's an interesting question because it, it puts a little bit of emphasis on the fact that we don't always work with teams and develop mm-hmm. groups. We really work with the individual, but obviously small groups and camps and clinics and stuff like that, they're, they're a big part of the team development. Learning how to correlate what they do one-on-one to the team is, is important. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's always going to be a value. I think it's going to grow even more in terms of privatized training programs, 100%. Yeah, cool. So what, what would you say to a coach that's watching this or even listening who is thinking of starting a business but hasn't yet done it? I would ask what their goals are. If their goals are just to make money, then they should, then they're very well on the right to do it, but they're losing the, the, the actual value of it. If your goal is to go out there and develop and see the, 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 the kids grow or even the college players grow, mm-hmm. you're going you're gonna to value that more. It's not going to be just a job for you. And that's the reason why I really do believe Krill Keeper School has grown so much. Um, like I said, I, I'm in my fifth year, and now instead of me working with 40 goalkeepers for the entire year. I'm working with closer to a hundred goalkeepers. And a lot of them are goalkeepers that keep coming back to other Mm -hmm. programs. So, and and you see it, you see the goalkeepers that keep coming back from the winter to the, to the spring, to the, to the, uh, to the summer. My coaches are just like, Oh man, Parker, he's growing so much. He's doing this. So even my coaches who are younger, they, they see that value in how much the growth happens in in our clients. Mm-hmm. So make, make the goal something that you are going to say, I want to do this every day. That, mm-hmm. that what any coach who wants to start a business, that should, that should be your focus. From mm-hmm. there, you have to think about how are you going to do it? Yeah. So if you're just going to go about and do what someone told you to do, all you're doing is replicating someone else's information. And you're not making it yours. You're not going to be passionate about what you are bringing to the table. You're just going to be another coach who's regurgitating information. And you might be good at stimulating them and getting them to do it. But if they don't, if you don't know why you're doing it, how are they going to know why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely value the the growth of your clients Mm -hmm. over just making money definitely ask yourself, how are you going to do this? Why are you going to do it? And then, and then, and then go out and don't, don't, don't hold back. Like if I, if I was subtle with it, I, I wouldn't have been able to enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, and, but the, there's a caveat to that. And don't go into it thinking that you're the best. Like mm-hmm. there's other people that you're learning from. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be someone you're learning from, and that's going to make you better. No one's going to you because you're the best. They're going to you because you're providing something for their kid that gets them excited about getting out of bed. That's the key. That's the key. So yeah. if those Love that. you're going to, you're going to be a you're going to be successful, hundred percent. Love that. Love that. So so talk us through what is your your current sales process with your business then. So I would say about. About four years ago, when I really, because I, I started Krill Keeper School five years ago, and I had this desire to say, you know what, I want to want to take this to another level. I can see this being something that does also contributes to my family. I, I'm, I'm married. I have, I have mortgage, so my time I do want it to be valued, but I also want to be able to provide because I have twin babies at home, and I want to be able to take care of them as well. Yeah. So. Uh, and also my, my wife is very type A and she's like, Jack, I don't know how you live. You have a, a thing full of cash. What are you doing? And I was like, <laughs> you're, you're on the money. You're right. I got you. <laughs> so I talked to a few people that, that 
have either started their own businesses or work in things. And I actually, one of my goalkeeper's parents teaches about uh, web design. And the, he had a project during, uh, he's a professor at Marist College. And he, one of his projects, someone was deciding to build a website that was uh, built around sports. And he came across a program in his, in his studies mm -hmm. called Demosphere. And Demosphere is like a lot of different other companies uh, where they provide you a website, but they also provide you a backing. And this is where things really changed for me. Um, being able to not just, oh, I have a, like, I have the square. No, like I have an actual back, back database through Demosphere where every credit card transaction online or in person goes through it gets categorized gets placed i have everyone's contact info now not on a piece of paper on an excel spreadsheet uh, and it all gets logged on the website as they register for every single program whether they pay on credit card or cash or check is different but i they can't even register without putting their information into my database so now i've built a uh, now I've built a, an email like log for every single contact. Uh, I just sent out my summer camp information and obviously I go through it to make sure I'm not emailing college kids or people that have graduated through my program. So I just sent out an email to 86 uh, people last night by just selecting my previous programs, copying, pasting the Excel spreadsheet, plugging mm -hmm. it in, emailing it out. And now I have an email blast. And before I even start advertising to the outside, 86 of the goalkeepers I already work with mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. access to my program. Uh, the, web, the website is a little limited. Uh, I know that some of the other programs are really good at being diverse, adding video content, things like that, uh, mm -hmm. such as Wix. I fiddled with that prior to Demosphere, but using Demosphere has really paid off um, they do take a small percentage cut from credit card transactions as part of the, the service that they provide me. Mm -hmm. But in the team, my company went from a, a system where I did not have knowledge of exactly what my profits are to yeah. being able to say, this is how much I spent with my credit card mm -hmm. and how much I have made through my mm -hmm. camps, clinical things for an entire, like, and I can cut it and I can log and look at the differences between one summer camp to another summer camp. I can look at, well, this week has performed better than this week over the last two years, three years. I can look at my uh, locations to say, is this worth it? And it, and it really makes a big difference for me in terms of all of my expenses in the grand scheme. Mm -hmm. So having that, over the course of five years now, now I know exactly what is coming in, what is going out, and I can better pay my coaches because of it. Where before it was like, all right, well, we got 40 kids this time, so I can give you this much. Oh, we only have 15. So listen, even though you did the exact same thing, I'm only going to be able to, no, I know exactly what I'm going to have for an entire summer. I could say before the first day of the first program, you are guaranteed this regardless of how many kids are in the third camp. Mm -hmm. And the, and the, my coaches appreciate that even more. And that's, that's one thing that I would say. My program would not be successful if, A, I'm not hiring people that I trained, but, B, that they don't want to keep coming back. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they, they make my, my summer camps highly successful because they know what we're teaching. I can talk to them quickly about it. If yeah. they're messing, call them out on it real quick, and then mm -hmm. they take they take the program seriously, while also yeah. knowing, hey, listen, we get to come here, kick soccer balls, and have fun with kids while teaching them, so they enjoy it too. Yeah. So yeah, but that getting get finding Demosphere, getting a business relationship with them has been monumental to my program. Yeah. Now that software you use was there was there an investment you had to make for that? It was a very small investment prior to. It was five hundred dollars for just the uh, for exclusively for just the website design. 
Okay. And then they give me tools, they trainings on how to edit the website afterwards. Like I said, they're a little limited in terms of what they can do, but their mm -hmm. focus isn't on that. They're focused, mm -hmm. they hire, so, uh, I don't know if they hire outside or they have a hired personnel that does the websites. Um, if there's anything, something that I can't do, I contact them. They, we set up a, a meeting time and we change it. Uh, mm -hmm. But the majority of things, there's a, and the other thing too is there's also a, a, a normal business hour time slot where I can reach out and there's always someone that I can reach out to during that time period. Hey, I'm having trouble with this part of my computer or this part of the program. Yeah. And they will be like, oh, you need to, I see what's happening. They'll log in. They'll see exactly what I'm doing. And they'll be like, mm. this, this is what we need to change, or this is why it's not working for you. So the small, the, the investment was $500 up front. And then from that point, then it became uh, like, there's no more investment in the website at all. It's ex exclusively, they give me unlimited aid while I'm with it. The only thing that they take is they take a, a small percentage of every credit card transaction. Okay. So for the parent, so what I, with, and, they, and they're open and honest, they say, this is how you can go around our credit card transaction. If your camp is $400, $400 add that percentage to the credit card fee and that percentage can take it out and you still make $400. Yeah. And we explain to the parents, hey, when you pay a credit card fee, this is, the, when you pay a credit card, this is what it is. If you're gonna pay with cash or check, understand that we're gonna be counting you for the, the two weeks prior to the program. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and and to be fair, the majority of parents are okay with paying the credit card fee, um, but some, some would prefer to say, hey, listen, I have two girls that are gonna to come to all three of your programs, so I'm gonna just write you a check. I say, okay, that's fine. So. So a lot of the coaches, when, when they start working with us, they, they, they use that cash in hand system. So tell us how, how important was it to make an investment? Cause I'm, I'm guessing all your clients, when they enroll with you, they have to go through the online system, right? Yeah. That's hundred percent. So, so how so it important was is it to, to invest in a software like that? Because a lot of coaches don't want to, don't want to do that because of a fear that they have for yeah, whatever it, reason. It, it's, it, I'll be honest with you. I had the fear as well. It's mm. an irrational fear. It really is. It's one of those that once you do it, then you're like, oh, why didn't I do it sooner? Um, and, but it's also like, well, I have, to, I have to commit this time and blah, 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 blah. The fact is, is that you're going to be giving up more time and getting more headaches by doing a cash-based system because you're – you're going to, if you're going to do cash check, you're going to be handing out flyers, asking them, flyers or, or like mailing out things and you're going to have them fill it out, write a check, mail it to you. And then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to log everything in on your own to develop your email databases that you want, where the systems that are in place because of modern technology really speeds up, it expedites your time and in my opinion time is money when it comes to that mm -hmm. being able to guarantee that you're going to get 20 people before the 20th with either a special discount early bird prices things like that that you can do now mm -hmm. where you couldn't do when it's cash based because when it's cash based you're like oh and, and then you're just nobody signs up and then you're just like all right well um uh well we're gonna if you come i'll, I'll make a half price for you now you're cutting your costs even more and you're even hurting you you're cutting your own legs out front of you just to get numbers up mm -hmm. and when you're doing it that way it's like i said it's it's too many small headaches mm -hmm. that build into one stressful working environment for yourself it mm -hmm. would be like owning a bar and saying i'm not going to take credit cards yeah why would you do that? Yeah, obviously your bartenders are going to be happy, but you will not be. <laughs> so like, <laughs> yeah. it, it just, yeah. you're, better, you're, you're better off developing, like, like taking that step and building that relationship. But the truth is you do have to do your research. You do mm -hmm. got to, you got to, you have to look around. You have to say, what is the best thing for me? If you're just a personal trainer that's going to float around and do things, it, you can get away with 
a smaller system. But if you if you want to work with large numbers, you, you you're gonna you're you're gonna limit yourself by being paper and cash, and because mm. you're never you're never gonna reach that higher numbers. It's like for, specifically speaking, my last winter clinic in January, we did every single Friday for an hour and a half for all of January, one week of February. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one snow cancellation, so we moved it to an additional February week, um, but rented out a bubble, did this because of my, my not having to log everything on my own. My numbers grew from 25 to 42 goalkeepers from the previous winter. Now I have 42 goalkeepers and that's, it was about 15 I've never seen before. So it's 15 goalkeepers I've never worked with before that I now have their information without having to be like, all right, well, let me, let me pull this together and let me look this up and let me find out where they're from and log it into my computer. No, I have it. It's ready to go. I don't have to stress about that. So it might, it's, it's just, it's a headache you don't need. Yeah. When you start thinking about the greater, like the larger numbers, the greater programs. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So, so last question for you, Jack. Um, where, where do you see your business in the next five years? You know, it's funny. Five years ago, my wife asked me that. And I've been, I've been debating, I've been having this conversation with myself specifically about that. And I was, the, the short answer is getting back to what it was right before the pandemic and the direction that it was right before the pandemic was residential camps. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, it's a big, big market that isn't being tapped into, especially in my area pandemic that hit especially New York, I hit pretty hard. Um, mm -hmm. before that I had my first ever residential goalkeeper camp at a local college that I was working at. Um, the, I had a challenge and the challenge was that they only had two goals and that doesn't work with a goalkeeper camp. You do need multiple goals. So <laughs> I, actually, I actually had to go get and bring goals in a U-Haul. Like mm -hmm. I rented out a, a truck and brought over like seven by 21s because that's all that could fit in there. And mm -hmm. I brought them or two there and I, I rented them out for a week from another facility and brought them back. And uh, the camp was highly successful. We had 38 in our first week uh, ever doing it. And the plan was to then make two weeks of residential camp uh, where I was going to do one there and then one at another college. But with the pandemic shutting us down, that was the, it's kind of made it so colleges are a little bit more tight to letting that happen for an outside rental. So within five years, I think my plan, I, I, I know what I want, and that is to have two to three residential goalkeeper camps that also are local enough that can still host the day camp kids, the young, the young goalkeepers that aren't ready for it, or the locals that can just go there. Because the reason is, is like, I have, I have goalkeepers that drive from Pennsylvania for my camps and I have goalkeepers that drive from the uh from New York City that come to my camps mm -hmm. and to make life easier I've actually heard that they rent out a house during my week and so it's not a long commute every single day yeah and I, I I hear them I feel them and I know that there would be a greater tap for the youth development but also the advanced development of goalkeepers if we were able to provide two to three residential goalkeeper camps in the Hudson Valley. Awesome. Yeah, so that, awesome. that would be my, that's my goal in the next five years that we are converting at least our summer program to that. Awesome. That's awesome. And uh, well, good, good luck with that. And I'll definitely be uh, following your, your, your journey with that. So well, think, thanks Jack for, for coming on. Thanks for sharing your, your expertise, your advice, your story with, with our viewers. Um, now, if anyone watching or listening wants to, to follow your, your business or even wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, the best way to get in contact with me is via email, which is carillokeeperschool at gmail.com. You tags for my Instagram page and Facebook are exactly the same, Carillo Keeper School. 
And the, you can also go to my website, which is www.curlkeeperschool.com. Awesome, awesome. What we'll do is we'll put that uh, below the video so anyone watching can, can, can follow you there. All right, Jack, well, it's been a pleasure. And again, good luck with everything. And I hope you reach your goal. And I hope to see loads of residential camps in the next five years. I hope so too. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry for, uh, I know I can, you, these type of questions, I could go for hours on. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I'd appreciate you not, not being like, hey, listen, got to pull back a little bit. I do appreciate it. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, take care, Jack. All right, you too. Thanks.